Okay, I'm gonna yell real loud. So, nah, screw the microphone. This makes me feel awkward. I'll be like this. Hey, yeah. Um, okay, so I don't have a lot of vocal power, so I'm just gonna talk about this level of excitement. We. Oui. Uh, but Colin, would you open us up in a word of prayer? We'll jump right into Hebrews. Amen. Cool. So what, what's going on this week? Anything new and unusual other than uh, Noah and Cruz getting baptized? What? <laughs> Have you noticed a fundamental difference in Cruz? Yeah. All right. <laughs> never mind. Never mind. Never mind. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Ainsley, have your hand up. Yeah. Oh, when's that? This weekend? Yeah. So you guys all fired up for that? Who's going up? Raise your hand if you're going up. Wow, a lot of you guys are. Wow, a lot of you guys are going up. Unreal. Hey, by the way, uh, shout out to everybody. God, my voice is just cabbage. I got to slow down. I can't talk that loud. Uh, shout out to everybody who helped Tony yesterday do his uh, cleaning out his closets. Uh, I pulled up this morning, and I got out of my car, and Tony just went off on a rant on you guys. And what he said was, you know, Anchor House, those guys are unreal. They're, like, going off, man. Those guys are just so rad. They're, you know, <laughs> well, right on, man. Way to, way to go, Anchor House. Yeah, that's sick. Okay, let's jump into Hebrews. I know it's been a while, and my voice is kind of cabbage. I kind of made up a little bit of a new review, but it's I changed it a little bit. Jesus is greater than who or what? Moses. Moses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, why was the old covenant insufficient? People. People. Yeah, we suck. Um, and how can we enter into the Holy of Holies, God's presence, without getting fried like Uzzah? Covered by the blood. Covered by the blood. By the way, who was, uh, who was the king at the time of Uzzah? This is just Bible trivia. It has nothing to do with Hebrews. It was David. It's an interesting story. The Philistines had captured the Ark of the Covenant, but everything went wrong for them. So they actually told the Jews, we want to give you your Ark back. And you know what the Jews said? Okay, but you'll have to pay us. <laughs> and they actually, do you catch the humor of that? They, the Philistines who had beaten the Israelites in war actually had to pay them to take God back. I don't know if you see the humor in that. But so they, then they stuck it in this place called Sikoth or something where it stayed uh, at a guy's house, Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And then, uh, no, it was actually before Obed-Edom. And then they were like, okay, let's, let's bring the ark back to Jerusalem. But they screwed up. Here's more. This is just random Bible trivia. How are you supposed to carry the ark between places? Anybody? Poles, right? Yeah. But what they did, they stuck the ark on the back of an ox cart. Whoops. And as they were going along, the ox cart hit a rock, and the whole wagon started to teeter. And Uzzah was like, oh, he was being helpful. And he touched the holiness of God, and he got fried. Why? No more covered in blood. So that's a little, little object lesson about why it's important. The blood of Christ is how we can dwell in the presence of God and not get fried like Uzzah. Okay, another name for Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith, right? Faith is what we believe about God. Yeah, you're right. I, I was going to say what? Huh? And then what he has promised. You guys are great. Okay, who of all the people in Genesis, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, etc., ever possessed the promised land, created a great nation, or saw their descendants bless the nations? No. Nobody. But what were they commended for passing on? The promise, the promise yeah. That's, that's kind, of the, kind of a cool trick question there for the review. Because even though they never possessed all those promises, they passed them on. Yeah, It's kind of like us. In this life, we will never possess heaven, but we get a chance to sort of turn other people on to Christ and the promise of heaven, yeah? 
Oh, by the way, two acts of faith in according to chapter 11 of Hebrews, the people are involved in two great acts of faith. What were they? Crossing the Red Sea. Crossing the Red sea? Ooh, that's a good one because it's from last week, and I know it feels like 10 years ago, but it was only a week ago. Has it been two weeks? Yeah, okay. I'll give you even more grace. Yeah. The people in faith, Gabe? Jericho. Yeah, Jericho. Good answer. It's almost like playing Bible trivia with you guys. It's kind of fun, yeah? Good job. Oh, and then this is kind of an open-ended question. Like, there's not really, like, one right answer I'm looking for. But in general, what do, because this is kind of like the last of the Hall of Fame guys, kind of like the rogues gallery or whatever. What do Gideon, Barak, Samson, David, and Jephthah all have in common? Say what? They're named? Is that what you said? Yeah. What, what did you say, Joseph? They all kind of messed up. Yes. I, I, I like what you said. They all kind of messed up. They were highly imperfect people, and yet they made it into the hall of faith because when push came to shove, eventually they did the thing that God wanted them to do. Okay? So we finished the hall of faith last week, all these great guys, and now we turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, and we run smack into the first word, which is? Therefore. Yeah. So you got to pause there in a second. Therefore, what's it there for? You all know the stupid joke. Yeah, what's it there for? Well, in other words, in the light of what just happened. So in the light of all these people, and I can't say all these men because Rahab's in there too, which I love, and also Sarah. Yeah, there's women in the hall of faith. Yeah. Therefore, we also, oh, including us, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside, what does your version say? Let us lay aside what? Every weight. weight? Does anybody have something besides weight? Everything that hinders, yeah? Okay, that's good. I kind of like weight. I'm actually using a different Bible today because I left my Bible in my car last night. I switched cars. It's a long story, but I'm using my John MacArthur, which is New King James instead of NIV. And I didn't, it, I didn't have weight, and I liked weight. I thought weight was really good. Okay, so by the way, therefore, in the light of these things, it sounds an awful lot like Paul, doesn't it? Paul, like in Romans, when he's like, therefore, in the light of all the grace God has given you, right? Because who's the great cloud of witnesses that he's talking about? It's really not a trick question. Everybody from chapter 11. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, that's who he's talking about. He's talking about all the heroes. Therefore, since we're surrounded, which is an interesting word to use considering all those people have been dead for hundreds of years, right? But he's like, on the basis of all... Oh, I'm sorry, I put it, should have put this up, yeah? On the basis of all those great testimonies of faith, and then he includes us. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. In fact, I'm going to keep reading. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne. Now, I thought this was interesting. When he says lay aside every weight, I'll be honest with you. I didn't know what he was talking about because he says lay aside the weight and lay aside your sin. Now the sin I think is pretty obvious to all of us. Like sin is not healthy for your life in Christ or whatever. Um, did anybody else know like, well I have John MacArthur's idea of what the weight is, but what do you, does anybody have any guesses on that? I didn't really know. So if you don't know, you're in good company. Yes, Joe. Lily. Yeah, Piper says anything that maybe leads to sin, maybe maybe even like, like a distraction, <laughs> right? You know, like like my wife's addicted to TikTok. <laughs> I can't believe that. I know it's like I'm married to a teenager, but whatever. Yeah, but she even said yesterday, I maybe got to get more of my life. Now I don't know that looking at TikTok is a sin, but I think it could be a distraction from living the full abundant life in Christ. However, that's excellent. I, I wouldn't disagree with John Piper on that. I think he's onto something there. But you know what MacArthur said was interesting? In fact, because I'm using his Bible, I just happened to read this. This is what he says. 
Different from the sin mentioned next, this might refer to the main encumbrance weighing down the Hebrews, which was the Levitical system with its stifling legalism, yeah? The weight, so they kept getting dragged back to like temple worship and sacrifice and the, maybe the, the dietary laws and trying to maintain, you know, don't eat pork, don't mix your milk with meat or whatever. Remember we covered all that in Leviticus, yeah? Like those things aren't necessary and they weigh you down even though they're not sinful. You see the difference, yeah? So what would be an example of Christian legalism? that you could get all dragged down on? I don't know. What's, what's, <laughs> I can't think of a good example. That, that was right off the top of my head. I didn't have an answer for you. But maybe, like, what's, what's classic Christian legalism that's not, yeah, listening to secular music, yeah, making that your focus. Oh, here's one, since I'm reading the new King James, you know there's the King James only people? Have you ever heard Rick rant about them? Rick can't stand King James only people, yeah? But what they do is they make that like the litmus test of faith, right? As if what are the most important thing about our faith, yeah, is what reading the correct Bible and making that like the be all end all. Uh, I'll give you an example. Where's Ezra? Like for example, Ezra. <laughs> so when I first got saved, I was smoking weed, right? And for the first, uh, sorry, there you go again, Ezra, yeah, like Ezra. <laughs> and so the first year I became a Christian, that became like the biggest thing in my life, right? Like, I got to quit smoking weed because I'm a Christian now. Now, by the way, we could argue whether or not it's sin or not, but regardless, it was a weight dragging me down because at a certain point, I was asked to join the worship band, and I'm not a rocket scientist, but I figured out guys leading worship probably aren't smoking weed during the week, right? right? But what I found out later on was that's a manini thing. What's manini mean? It's a Hawaiian word for small. Who said small? Who got that? Is that you? Yeah, way to, way to go, Ireland. Oh, you speak Hawaiian, sister. Oh. <laughs> you just know that. Manini. Did you know Anini Beach used to be called Manini Beach, but the M fell off the sign, and so they, they left it. Now it's Anini Beach. You learn all kinds of interesting things with me, don't you, yeah? Manini means small, because what God eventually taught me was things like learning to love people, learning to have a mature relationship in Christ are really the important things, but you might call the whole weed thing was a weight that was just sort of dragging me down. Whether it's sin or not, it's dragging me down. Sin, on the other hand, which he says, yeah, sin which so easily ensnares us. I don't think I really need to explain that. Do I put the proverb up there? Yeah. The evil deeds of a wicked man ensnare them and the cords of his sin hold them fast. You know, I don't know that I need to share exact examples with any of you, but everybody in this room has probably at one time or another sinned against somebody or gossiped and got caught. And then you have to deal with the consequences. Have, please tell me, you all have at least at one time in your life did something that at a certain point you thought, man, I wished I had never done that. Yeah? And that's a great example. The sin, it snares you like a cord. It sounds fun or it's tempting and you think, ah, what the heck? And then, you know, a week later, like, why did I do that? Why, 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 why? And then you're trying to get out of it, right? Trying to like take care of the things that have happened, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. Now, he says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And the word I use for that is perseverance, steady as she goes. And so I'll let you pause to write all that stuff down because I know you guys like to write stuff. And I put down this verse um, from Philippians. This is Paul speaking Hey, brothers and sisters, I don't even consider myself yet to have to take and hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and streaming towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal. In other words, to, to look at that goal and go for it, to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This is called perseverance. Now, can I pause here for a second and just say, if there was one thing I wanted you to take home today from today's lessons from Hebrews I would love to just focus on that word, perseverance, right? And the reason why is this. Um, maybe about 10, 15 years into my walk as a Christian, 
I began to be less impressed with amazing acts of faith or amazing changed lives. You know, the guy that comes to church and he's a big hot mess and maybe his wife's ready to divorce him because he's a hopeless alcoholic and he comes to Christ and he gets saved and all of a sudden he's in the front row every day. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And people get really excited about rescue stories like that. And people are like, isn't that great? Isn't that great? What a success for God. But I've realized over the years, I am less impressed with the really radical, wild people of the faith. Like even, I'll give you guys as an example, yourselves. I'm super impressed with you guys. I really am. I think the Anchor House guys this year freaking rock, yeah? And I'm seeing growth in you guys, and I'm super amped on you guys. But quite frankly, I'm not as impressed with you guys as my friend Bill Swanson, who uh, is this friend of mine. I've known him actually since San Diego. He moved over here, gosh, about 40 years ago, long before I ever did or whatever. And Bill Swanson never does anything great around the church. Really. About all Bill Swanson does is show up on Sunday mornings. And that's about it actually, quite frankly, yeah? And when we talk, we talk about things of the Lord and this and that. And I know he reads his Bible and he prays, but he doesn't do a whole lot. He's not a rock star of the faith. But you know what I love about Bill Swanson? Is for about 30 years now, every Sunday, he's in church, right? He's been through the ringer. His first wife got addicted to drugs. He became an alcoholic and all of that. Then they got sober. Then she died suddenly. Big tragedies, like big disasters. One of his kids committed suicide, which was a huge disaster. All his kids came through the youth group, da-da-da. But all through it all, every Sunday, where is he? Church, yeah? Guy's walking with the Lord. So get my point. He's not a rock star, but you know what I love about him? perseverance. I love that. If you guys want to really impress me, be walking with the Lord 50 years from now when I'm dead watching you from heaven. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Um, when I, um, about, I don't know, it's about, whew, okay, my kids are what, 20, 21, so about 15, 16 years ago, right? I took my kids to England. They were in second and fourth grade, and we went to Cape and Ray Bible School because I wanted to show them where I went to Bible school. And I remember somebody said to me, oh, are you going to make your kids go to Cape and Ray? Which is kind of funny, like you can make your kids you know, go to Cape and Ray. Did anybody make you come here? You're, you're here by choice, right? Okay, yeah. And I was like, I don't know. But a couple of years after I visited Cape and Ray with my kids, I got to thinking about it. So here's what I did. Forgive me if I tell you this story again, because I'm old and I forget what stories I tell you guys. But at one point, I was wondering, I wonder if I should really encourage my kids to go to Cape and Ray, which is like Anchor House for you guys, right? And I had this idea one day, and that is I contacted everybody that I was still in contact with from Cape and Ray through Facebook. We've all stayed in or a few of us have stayed in touch. And then around here, you know, there's a bunch of people that went to Cape and Ray, because, you know, Rick Bunchu did, but also two of his boys, Mason and Justin, did. Um, Alicia Clater, she taught at One Day Bible School. And I called, I'm going to guess I contacted 10 Facebook people, and I made eight phone calls of everybody I knew who had been to Cape and Ray. And here's the question I asked them. I said, out of everybody you know, that you're still in contact with, that you went to Cape and Ray with, how many people do you know that have fallen away from the Lord and no longer walk with Jesus? And do you know what? Out of that, what, 18-odd people, out of all those people, we only came up with one guy. And as it turned out, he was a classmate of Rick Bunshu's in 1969, who Rick says, by the way, we don't really think he was really a Christian when he showed up at Cape and Ray. He just showed up because I was there and he decided to stay. Maybe he had a crush on one of the girls or something, yeah? And then later on, he kind of abandoned the Lord. And then did you hear how he died? Have I told you this story? He was smuggling weed, <laughs> Ezra, out of Mexico in an airplane. And they were flying low to stay underneath the radar. And they hit a freeway overpass and he was killed instantly. <laughs> now, that's not the punchline of the story. That's just a little aside. My point is this. I love the fact that when I found out everybody that I could think of, even friends and friends of those friends, something about going to Cape and Ray 
anchored them. Well, that was good for today, isn't it, for you anchor house guys? Gave them a base, and 20, 30, 40 years later, they're still walking with the Lord. That really impresses me, and therefore I encourage both my gits to go to Cape and Ray, and they did. So perseverance, if you get one thing out of this, whether you have like a rock star for the Christian faith, you know, you become the next, you know, Bill Graham or Billy Graham or whatever, you know, you do missions or you just kind of lope along, do it, live in your life. But every Sunday, where, you are, where are you? Church, right? Raising your kids to know the Lord. Yeah. Maintaining a Christian marriage in your household. If you do that for the next 50 years, I personally will be super impressed and super stoked, yeah? I think sometimes we don't make a big enough deal about people that just walk quietly, steadily, and slowly with the Lord through their life, okay? With the endurance for the race set up. Okay, now he says to do this, he says, looking unto Jesus, does your version say eyes fixed on Jesus? Or looking into Jesus, what is your version? Looking to Jesus. What version do you have, Marie? ESV. Oh, you have ESV? Does anybody have the new NIV? Okay, what version is the the um, verse 2, 12-2. You have NIV? It says fix your eyes on Jesus. All right. Um, oh, eyes fixed on Jesus. I have a couple illustrations here for you. Malachi will like this picture. Oh, that's way before your time. Um, okay. This is... An object lesson illustration. Um, did you know, like, your body follows your eyes? Like, you always lead with your head, you lead with your eyes, right? So that's why I put these two pictures up here, because I'm going to tell you a brief story. Um, when I was about 14 or 15, this guy's name on the top there, that's Sean Thompson, and that's actually a specific picture from a specific winter. I think it was the winter of 73 or 74. No, no, it was later than that, maybe 75. And here's why. Back in the day, getting in the tube on a big board meant you pretty much just set one line, and then the wave broke over you, and either it slapped you down or... You went straight and you made it out. Now, I know I'm, what is, I hope I'm explaining this correctly to you guys, yeah? Until this guy came along named Sean Thompson, who was uh, born and raised in South Africa, spent a lot of his time surfing Jeffreys Bay, which has really good long barrels. And he brought in a shorter board, and what he started doing revolutionized surfing. Like, this is the guy. And it all happened during one winter at this wave, which is called Off the Wall, on the north shore of Oahu, right next to Pipeline. And what he started doing, nobody had ever done before. And what he was doing was once he got inside the tube, he started making all these little minor adjustments, up, down, up, kind of swooping and gliding and like manipulating using body English. And what it enabled him to do was it enabled him to stay in the tube longer than anybody ever had before and still come out. And they made a movie that winter. It was called Free Ride, yeah? And no, it wasn't called Free Ride, sorry. Yeah, it was. What was it called? Free Ride. Is that it? Yeah. And anyways, this revolutionized surfing. So somebody asked him once, Sean, how is it that you're able to ride the tube so deep and so long? And how do you know how to make all those little mini adjustments in the tube that keeps you in the tube so long? How do you do that? And he goes, well, I never think about what my body's doing. I never think about any of the adjustments I'm making. He says, what I do is I pick a point outside the tube while I'm in the tube, and all I think about is I need to get there. And I do whatever I have to do to just get there, and my body basically does the rest. Does that make sense? Yeah? Now, if that was a surfing analogy that went um, way past you, let me try a mountain bike analogy that I actually learned from a guy um, who's a pretty hardcore mountain bike rider. And he said that when he actually went and took a course on downhill mountain bike riding, and he said one of the first things they teach you if you're doing downhill mountain bike riding is where do you look? Where do you think you look? Yeah, you look at a point about 10 yards, 15 yards ahead of you. And you know why? They said, say you're racing downhill and you see this big rock. What happens if you look at the rock? You hit the rock. Don't look at the obstacles that are coming. 
look beyond them to where you want to go. Now, you see where I'm going with the illustration with Jesus, keeping our eyes on Jesus. But I will tell you, there's a little bit of a challenge to this and a caveat, and I don't really have the answer for you. But what does that even look like? What does it mean to keep your eyes on Jesus? And by the way, I don't think there's a wrong answer, so feel free to just raise your hand and tell me what you think. What does it look like in your life to keep your eyes on, to fix your eyes on Jesus? Anybody? Yeah, go ahead, Lauren. Not focusing on Yeah. <laughs> You're losing your voice, too. Yeah. Don't focus on your problems. Keep your head up. Look towards Christ and keep moving forward. Yeah, excellent answer. Yeah. Anybody else? No? I've talked you into complete, complete. Yeah, that's a good one too, Marie. Both those are really good. Don't be distracted by shiny things that don't point towards Jesus. Yeah, that's actually a good one. Yeah. What does it mean for you personally, anybody, to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus? Nobody? Bueller? Bueller? Yes, Ireland. Yeah. I, I would agree, and I think I've shared this with you before. It took me personally years before I had a pretty consistent devotional time, but now I finally do have one, and I think it's super rad to have a portion of your day that is directed directly at Jesus. I prefer the morning because it, you know, tends to launch me in the correct direction, if that makes sense, yeah? But, okay, those are just, I didn't have a right or wrong answer on that. I just, it sounds wonderful. Fix your, you know, you can just picture the church lady. Fix your eyes on Jesus and you'll be fine. You're like, okay, that sounds really spiritual, but what the heck does that mean? What does that look like, right? Okay, okay, and here is why. Um, Look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, by the way, the word that is translated by the NIV, author, is actually archagos, which is actually translated pioneer, right? And the finisher is my favorite Greek word that I've shared with you a lot, teleos, which means fullness, completed back into shalom as we were created in the garden. And basically what it's saying is he started you, he will finish you. Yeah, and I love that, yeah. I also like the word author. I don't know why they picked that, but I think it's kind of cool just because I love the idea that maybe what if, our, what if our lives were like stories, you know, written by God. Like we're, we're in, what's that? Um, oh, you guys are maybe too young. Everybody you guys watch the first Pirates movie with Johnny Depp, right, you know? And what's her name? What's her name? Elizabeth, Elizabeth is her first moment on the pirate ship. And she's like, you don't actually believe that, you know, expect me to believe we're in some kind of ghost story. What does she say? And then Captain Barbosa says, this is, you're in a ghost story. Yeah. She says, you know, oh, she says, yeah, I don't believe in ghost stories. And he says, oh, you're in one. Yeah. That's us. We're actually in a narrative story right now. And I think I've shared this before. Where, 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 where are we on the narrative? I'll answer it for you. We had Genesis, the garden, Abraham guys, Moses guys, the Israel nation. Jesus comes, the expected Messiah, you know, only instead of like, you know, casting off Rome, he gets crucified, he goes to heaven, and then he says, I'll come back 2,000 years ago, and that's where we are. We're in the narrative. Does that make sense? He hasn't come back yet, but we're waiting for him to come back. Meanwhile, we're in the narrative. We're part, and our little stories, our little dramas that we have, our um, problems that we have, our distractions away, and our keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus while we let God use us to do things like clean out the closet, to talk to kids about Christ this weekend at kids camp, Camp Abracadabra, right? You're part of the story, and God is using you and your story to affect other people's stories around so that when Jesus comes back, you'll be one of those people that were like useful to him. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. He's the author and the perfecter. Okay. So I'm actually going to skip down to uh, verse um, four. Yeah. Uh, well, I, oh, sorry. I, you guys want to write these down? Sorry. I thought author and perfect. By the way, you know why I picked this picture? Anybody tell me what's... What's the point of view of that picture? 
It's an interesting picture. I found it, I randomly was like looking at images and I saw that and then I went back to it. I'm like, wait, what is this? What's it a picture of? Yeah, that's Jesus' view from the cross. Isn't it like, what if Jesus had a GoPro on his head, right? Is that blasphemy? Sorry, <laughs> Rebecca thought so, yeah. I one time, every time I did a wedding with a GoPro on my head, because these people, they were kind of wacky people. They're related to the, uh, you know, the people that own Brennecke's Beach Broiler, the, the French's. Yeah, it was the French's son-in-law. It was his idea. He goes, yeah, I want you to, could you, would you wear a GoPro while you do the wedding? So I was doing all this stupid stuff, like, you know, are there rings? I'm like, let's get a close-up, you know, and stick my head in, you know. <laughs> it's really kind of dumb, yeah? Anyways. Isn't that an interesting picture? That's the view from the cross. And the reason why I picked that picture is because Jesus, it says, he, he, when it says he endured the cross in our scriptures, it actually means he looked past the cross. And what I was thinking about when I saw this picture was imagine like Jesus looking down from the cross and he knows every single person there and he knows their story and he knows how their story is going to end up. They're all wrapped up in the drama of the moment, yeah? But God's will is being done, and he looks down, and he is the author of their stories, and that's his view from the cross. Does anybody else kind of find that interesting? I thought that was sort of like, I thought that was, okay. So let's get to the, um, um, the discipline part, and I think we're going to start like speeding it up because I thought we'd be done by now. My apologies. You guys are like, yeah, shut up, Dan. Okay, verse 4. Verses 4 to 6, um, you have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, or you can use disciplines there, the NIV says disciplines, and he scourges, 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 anybody? Scourges every son whom he receives, okay? So, um, first of all, Christ suffered. Was his suffering meaningless? No. In fact, it was dripping with meaning, yeah? The root of all suffering, by the way, is sin, and Christ suffered because he bore our sin. He bore the sin, and therefore he suffered, but not from his sin. He suffered for our sin, but sin always brings suffering. However, I want to quote to you something from my principal of Bible school, uh, Matthew Price, or excuse me, Charles Price. He said this, gosh, this is what, 30, no, 25 years ago that I was there? No, 28 years ago, yeah? And I never forgot this. I thought this was really good. I'll do it with his English accent, the way he says it. He says, do you understand? God never lets the Christian suffer just to sort of stick it to him, as if he says, oh, that." Yeah, you're going to sin? Oh, you'll be sorry about that. And, and he sticks his thumb on you and, you know, grinds you down, right? Just to make you suffer. No, no. The point, the reason we suffer from our sin is so that we will grow from it. That there's always a purpose behind the suffering, even if we cause it ourselves, yeah? And so the author of Hebrews is now pointing out the importance of what he calls heavenly discipline, Yeah? So it's interesting because verse 4 can be translated either to mean struggling and suffering because of your own sin, or it can also be translated, so it reads, we suffer because of the sinful world we live in. In other words, we're all, every, everybody in this room is going to suffer because of sin, but like Jesus, it might not even be our own sin. You know, like... Um, you ever hear someone say, well, why do you believe in a God? I don't believe in a God who would cause bad things to happen to good people. Do bad things happen to good people? Yes. And according to Jesus, who's good anyways? Nobody, right? But yeah, quite frankly, sometimes you're just kind of minding your own business and maybe even in the process of doing something good for somebody else and something really bad happens. But even that suffering won't be for nothing. God can use that to grow you. He calls that in his word discipline, yeah? And so I think that I put Proverbs 3 up there. Oh, yeah, it is up there. Yeah, don't despise the Lord's discipline. Don't resent. That's interesting, yeah? 
Have you ever been mad at God because you were suffering for something? I have, yeah. Uh, I know somebody right now who's, who's struggling because they were really pissed off at God, and now they're like back, and they're like, eh, can I, uh, is God still okay with me? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely, yeah. In fact, didn't we teach about that last night? Who was there last night? I was talking about contending with God. Yeah, you guys asked me about it last night, yeah. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in, yeah? It's part of his love. It's sort of like what, you know, Rick always likes to talk about tough love. Has he told you about tough love, you know? Loving people sometimes means allowing the harsh thing to happen, which, by the way, there's a huge element of um, trust there. So let's read 7 and 10. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. Boy, that sounds an awful like, like Proverbs right there, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, but if you are without, oh yeah, because for what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Now, please tell me, I think most of you were raised by your father in this room, right? Yeah. Did your dad not discipline you? Yes. I know. I look around. Yeah. And he did that because he loves you, right? That's it. He did it out of love. Um, sorry, I know I've told this story to me. I already told you the story of the stinky towel when I went to college, right? I thought I told that for sure, no? Okay, maybe I'll tell you the story again then. Sorry if I'm repeating myself. But um, my freshman year in college, uh, about, I don't know, a couple months into me living in the dorm, one day I went to go pick up my towel to take a shower, and that's not the actual picture, but I just Googled it, yeah? But that's kind of where my towel lived, on the floor. And I went to go pick it up, and I smelled something horrific. Guess what it was? My towel. Yeah, because I never bothered to hang up my towel for a couple of months, yeah? And I had this, you guys ever seen that cartoon, Ratatouille? <laughs> you know the last scene? You know the scene where the, the food critic takes the bite of the food that the rat <laughs> made? And he has this total flashback to being in his mom's kitchen. Do you remember that? you remember that? That's kind of what happened to me the moment I picked up my towel and went, ew. I had this total flashback in my head of my dad going, pick up your, and I won't say it because he swore a lot, my dad, pick up your towel. Do you think the mystery maid's going to pick up your towel? Who the hell you think's going to pick up your towel? Pick up your, you know, oh, all right, yeah, whatever, you know. And then once a week, my mom would wash all the towels, right? And I had this total flashback like, oh. That's why you hang up your towel when you're done taking a shower. And here's the revelation I had at that moment. My dad wasn't being a jerk. He was actually trying to teach me something, right? So I'll finish the story. I had, what I realized is he was right about everything. You ever heard this one? When you're done using a tool, <laughs> your dad too, huh? Yeah, guess what I discovered in my, in my later days? Where the hell's my wrench? Right? Right? Where's my five sixteenths? Oh, crap. Right? All those things I realized. So I called my dad. Now, this is before cell phones. I actually, you know, one ringy dingy, you know, wait for, you know, my mom answers. Hi, honey. Hi. You know, I'm like, hey, could you put dad on the phone? So they're both on the phone together. Honey, pick up the phone. You know, whatever. Yeah, this and that. And they're like, hey, son, what's up? And, you know, my parents, they're such great people. They're always so happy. Even today, if I called them today, oh, my gosh. Hi, Dave. They, love, they just love, isn't that great? I love my parents. They're so happy to hear from me. Yeah. And they go, what's up? And I go, well, uh, I called to tell you something. And they're like, sure. Well, well, what? And I said, well, I called to tell you you were right. And then there's this, like, awkward pause. <laughs> and my dad says, about what? And I go, well, about everything. You know, like about you know, hang up your towel when you're done taking a shower so it stays dry. And you know how when you said, like, put tools back? Well, then you'll know where it is and, and use the right tool for the job. And if you're going to do a job, do it right. All those things. You were right. And there's another pause. And my dad says, son, have you been drinking? <laughs> and I said, no. I just called to tell you, you were right. Okay? Now, how perfectly does that story fit the scripture? Yeah. What does Jesus say? If one of you has a son and they ask for a piece of bread, will you give them a snake? No, right? Because you, you love, and God loves those who he disciplines, yeah? So let's keep reading, because he's using, we're almost, oh man, we got five minutes. Okay, we're almost done. Verse eight, but if you are without 
chastening or discipline of which all have um, become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he, he being God, is for our profit. That's what the NKJV says, yeah? That we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening or discipline seems joyful at the present time. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. But painful, nevertheless. But afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of the righteousness to those who have been trained for it. So this is called his exhortation towards the spiritual life. Yeah, no discipline seems pleasant at the time. I think we've sort of covered this. Oh, okay, one last story I'll share with you. Talk, he's just comparing the discipline from earthly fathers to um, heavenly fathers. And I'll give you one last example. I don't know if you find this helpful, but maybe you do, because like me, you probably have a lot of friends that come from divorced parents. When I um, got to college, uh, I knew this girl named Michelle, who I went to high school with, yeah? And one day, we were just hanging out talking story, and I said to this girl, Michelle, I go, you know, this sounds really stupid, but you know, I was really jealous of you when we were in high school. She goes, why is that? And I go, well, it's because when your parents divorced, your mom became the cool parent, and you got to do anything you wanted to do. And did you have friends like that? I sure did. I had a lot of friends. It wasn't just Michelle. I had a lot of friends. Their parents got divorced, and then their parents, like, kind of, like all the discipline went away and all of a sudden the kids kind of got to do whatever they wanted to do and they acted out and, and you know, psychiatrists would say, well, they're just acting out because of the divorce was hard on them. So they got like this full waiver, like, you know, a full get out of jail free card to go out and do all the stupid stuff that I wanted to do that I couldn't do because my parents wouldn't let me, <laughs> right? I had a curfew. Did you guys have a curfew? Yeah, I freaking hated my curfew, yeah? Whereas my other friends, I'll never forget what Michelle said. She said, oh, Dan, you have no idea. And I said, what's that? She goes, you have no idea how jealous we were of your parents. I was like, what? And she goes, yeah. Your parents, like, seemed to, like, really care about you and love you. And they had all these, like, really strict rules on you. But it was because they loved you and they cared about you. With our parents, we sort of had the feeling that, you know, they were too busy with their own issues. And so we could do what we wanted. But we didn't feel loved by that. Isn't that crazy? I was probably only 20 years old. That was some pretty deep wisdom from a 20-year-old gal who basically called me out. And she was right, yeah? Our parents who love us, our father who loves us, he gives us rules and regulations. And when we mess up, we suffer because of it. But it's for our own good. Amen? Okay. Lastly, I just stupid picture here. He's sort of, <laughs> isn't that funny? And this is um, the author of Hebrews says, um, Oh, in verse 12, we're going to wrap up with verse 12. He says, Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble needs, and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. It's basically an exhortation to exercise your faith. Remember, this whole chapter started with looking back on those faithful people from chapter 11. Remember all the heroes of the faith? But remember how imperfect a lot of those heroes were? What happened when they were imperfect? They suffered, right? See how faith, discipline works together? But they continued on, which is a P word that stands for? They persevered. And God honored them, and it went well for them in the end. Maybe, not, maybe the very, very end, like, you know, getting eternity with God or whatever, yeah? Yeah. But basically this, in fact, you know what, I'm just going to wrap up on this. I had these long verses out of um, Isaiah that just basically echo this whole thing. Exercise your faith. Make your faith strong. Work on your faith. Keep your eyes set on Jesus. Go for the, the long game. You know what it means to play the long game? Yeah. Think about what you're going to be like. I wrote it in the, one of the earlier slides, but I forgot about it, but I'll come back to you right now. Where do you see yourself in your faith? Not like your career, not like your romantic love life, but where do you see yourself in your faith five years from now? You'll be young adults. You'll be all of drinking age. 
you'll be out in the world. You won't be in the, like, the bubble of Anchor House or even the bubble of the house you grew up in if you, most of you grew up in Christian homes. But in five years from now, you'll have to pick up your own pallet, your own cross, choose your own friends out there from the world with all its distractions and things waiting for you. Where do you see yourself in your faith 10 years from now? 20 years from now, 30 years from now. How about 40 years from now when you're super old, like 60? Where at this stage of the game, you're an empty nester, right? And you're sort of like one of the elders of the church, yeah? That people are coming to for life advice about how do you raise kids? What do I do with my teenager? Where do you see yourself in your faith 40 years from now, yeah? I'll probably be dead, but I hope you're all just like, yeah, I'd be 100, never mind, yeah? Hope you're all walking with Jesus, persevering, yeah? Because you've been disciplined all along. Okay, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for a great lesson out of Hebrews, God. Super practical, super applicational, God. I would pray right now for everybody in this room right now that 40 years from now, Lord, if we're not like with you face to face in heaven, if we're still here on this planet, Lord, spinning around the sun, God, I pray for everybody in this room that we're still serving you, that our eyes are still fixed on you, that we're persevering, God, and we are of such great help to those around us because we bear the scars of perhaps our own sin, our own stupidity, God, the discipline that you've had to... um, treat us with God, but because of that, Lord, we have wisdom, we have value, and we are being used to help those that are coming up behind us. We pray these things in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. 